Yeah. Amen. You know, just the little bitty things that I've faced in my life compared to other people is very small. But little Matt was hurting. <laughs> and, and whenever people are hurting and they're broken hearted, they turn to other things. And those other things actually make the hurt even worse. Amen. Because those other things are sin. And whenever you and I engage in sin, what does it do? It just drives it more deeply on the inside of us. And when we give permission to the works of darkness, it just drives it deeper. And, and anybody in this place that's ever really kind of ever fallen away from the Lord for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. And we can end up a hot mess, for lack of better words. And we need the Holy Spirit to come through like a Russian river and bring cleansing and bring healing and bring deliverance. Yes. Amen? Amen. The greatest augmenter, if you will, the greatest help, well, besides the helper, is the truth that the helper wants to help us yes. speak forth. Because, you see, the truth combats a spirit of error. Now, look, I want you to see this. Look what it says. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. But look at this. According to the elemental spirits of the world. What I need you to understand is this. Any type of philosophical tradition, any type of doctrine that is even in the midst of the church, any type of human wisdom, intellect that is not from Christ, look what it says, According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. What it's saying is this, is that if there is a word, a teaching, a doctrine, a, whether it be a song, a movie, a social media gathering, in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament times, whenever Jesus walked the face of the earth, how would the spirit of error have spoken? A lot of different ways. A lot of different false religions, right? Even temple prostitutes. I know that's weird to talk about, but in the city of Corinth, they had temple prostitutes. Even the woman, you remember that? She had the spirit of divination. She came to the apostle Paul and she was like, these men be of the Lord. These men be from God most high. What did Paul do? He rebuked her because she was. She had a spirit, the Bible says, of divination. In the Greek language, it was a spirit of python. She was saying something that was true, but her purposes were not pure. Her motives were to steal the glory from Jesus and to bring it on itself. That's what demonic spirits do. They want the glory to be taken off of Jesus and for it to be brought to self. Listen, you and I have to be careful even in our walk with the Lord that we're not allowing the gifts that God gives us Amen. to turn into something that God never intended it to be. Amen. To where we desire to, when man wants to glorify himself instead of giving glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that's a problem. Amen. And so any type of teaching, any type of doctrine, any type of anything that is not of Christ, but instead comes through the elemental spirits of the world, and according to the human tradition of men, is going to take away instead of add to the things of God. It's important that you and I understand that. Because as we're trying to live for the Lord, as we're trying to give our heart to Christ, as we're trying to continue to move forward in the things of God, that God's doing a work. You know, God's doing a work. And look, a while back I told y'all that, that story that the Lord showed me where young David was holding the head of the giant. Y'all remember that? I've never seen that before. Young David kills Goliath. He's holding the head of the giant. He's talking to the king. But at the end, uh, but, but, but what, I, what, I, what I reminded you of too is that when Saul first started in ministry, what did he do? He took the Ark of the Covenant to try to defeat the Philistines. What happened? They took the Ark, the presence of God, that's what the Ark represents. They put it in the house of Dagon. What happened? The Dagon fell down on his face. The false god of the Philistines fell down on his face in reverence in the presence of God. They lifted him back up. The next day they went in. What happened? He fell down again, but his head was broken. See, the head, again, represents spiritual authority. And what I said in that message when I preached it was this. God's still doing what he always does, my friend. What does God do? He usurps spiritual authority over the authority of the enemy. The problem in that story was Saul's flesh. I don't think that I can scream that from the rooftop. 
not loud enough. And when I'm screaming it, I'm expecting it to ricochet off and come hit me right between the eyes also. That our flesh is the problem. Not the Spirit of God. Not the Word of God. Not the truth of God. No. He is more than capable to bring the victory. Amen. The problem comes when we get in the way. Yeah. And we don't allow the truth of God to minister to our hearts. So what I'm trying to talk about real quick has to do with this concept of these spirits and how we gain victory in the spiritual realm. I want you to understand that. Now look, here's another scripture in Colossians, about 10 verses later. Look what it says. Let no one disqualify you. Insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, Going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head. You see there? The head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. What he's saying is, look, don't let somebody come up in here and start teaching you doctrines and teachings, the traditions of men that are anointed not by the Holy Spirit, but by other types of spirits. Yes. It sounds good usually whenever it's coming forth. It doesn't sound like it's wrong at first, but it is wrong because it's not of the right spirit and it will end up disqualifying you. you. These are other types of... I'm just trying to make the point right here. Look, asceticism, what does that mean? Whenever somebody hurts themselves. Worship of angels. You're not supposed to worship an angel. See, in Colossae, there was a mixture of all kinds of stuff going on. He also says, you know, earlier he said about holidays and days. There was a mixture of Judaism along with it. But this is just one example. I'm just trying to use this as an example to show you. Look, in the modern church, we can have all kinds of stuff. Right? We can have... A seeker-sensitive movement that focuses only on the love of God. God is a loving God. Well, yes, He's a loving God. He sent His only begotten Son who died naked on a cross to pay the penalty of sin. But yet, at the same time, the seeker-sensitive movement doesn't want to preach against sin because they're scared it's going to offend people and people are never going to want to come back into the house of God. But the reality of it is, is that it's to know that I'm a sinner, to repent from sin. The Word of God says in the book of Acts that repentance brings refreshing. That's what brings refreshing, not for me to sit up here and to speak some little soft words that tickle your ears and make you feel better. No, what brings refreshing is for the truth of the gospel to be spoken, for the conviction of the Holy Spirit to touch the heart, to break the heart, and for us to come and allow ourselves to be broken in the presence of God and to allow himself to have his way with us. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Look, not holding fast to the head. You know, I'm not going to get into this, but I was thinking about this right here. Look at this. This is what we got to do, church. We got to hold fast to the head. <laughs> Who's the head? Jesus. Jesus. He's the head of the body. Amen. And look what happens when you hold fast to the head. I'm talking about you as a believer. Me as, as a believer. Us as a church. When we hold fast to the head, what happens? The whole body is nourished. Now look, we're not going to go there right now, but if we roll back, no, we are. Let's go there. Look, I want you to see this. Psalm 133. This is so beautiful. The Lord kept, the Lord kept ministering to me about this, okay? And I've been thinking about this passage of Scripture. And it's so powerful. Look, look at this. Unity. This is the caption. When brothers dwell in unity. David wrote this. How, behold how good, and let's read it in the kingdom. I like the King James. Oh. Let's read it in the King James. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Look at this. It is like the precious ointment or anointing oil upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. Listen to me. I want you to get a visual. Who's Aaron? He's a high priest. He's a high priest. He's the one that goes into the presence of God for the people. My God. The, the anointing was used, an oil was used to anoint the priests and the kings. All right. Just imagine he's using this anointing. This, he's using the unity of brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's describing it as the anointing oil that would run down upon Aaron's head. Aaron, his head as a type of Christ. Right? 
the anointing flows from the head, which is Christ. And it comes down upon the beard. But look, it comes down onto his garments. I want you to see. You can't see that. I can't see it with my physical eyes. But if you study it, you realize the high priest wore something called an ephah. And it had 12 stones in it. And the 12 stones were representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the oil is poured upon the head. The head is Christ. And it runs down upon the body, which is representative of the children of Israel, which is also in a spiritual sense representative of the body of Christ, which is you and I as believers. The anointing of the Holy Spirit comes from Jesus and what he's done for us at the cross. And it wants to flow down onto the body. And you and I as individuals, as the Holy Spirit's moving in our lives, and the Holy Spirit is moving his anointing in the midst of our lives, and we're coming together collectively in unity. The Holy Spirit wants to move in our midst because not, not just so that we can be blessed. He wants to bless us. Amen? Can I get an amen? He wants to bless us. But he wants to set people free. He wants to set people free, children of God. He wants people that, that are oppressed to be free. He wants people that are sick to be healed. He wants people that are going to hell to be saved. He wants people that are suffering with addictions and whatever it may be to be delivered. God wants to set the captive free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord. And so, so he says, listen, don't let anybody spoil you through vain philosophy, through the elemental spirits of the world. He's one that the apostle Paul would repeatedly again and again talk about truth. Amen. And so let's go ahead and talk about a little bit of truth right here. Can y'all see this all right? If you can't, you should always try to, to, to hold on to truth, my friend. Because there's all kind of error out there. Yeah, I Can know. I at least get you? Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Let me just go ahead. Let's make this interactive search. Y'all ready? Who's going to talk? Somebody's going to talk. I can see it. Somebody give me an example of where a voice of error in modern society could come and speak to you, a believer. Anybody just throw something up. Just throw your claw and go ahead and throw something up. Come on. Yes, sir. Music. Music. Robert said, I did that on purpose. I didn't call him. I'm tired of saying the same thing over and over again. I figured I'd let somebody else say it. Music. What kind of music? Rock. Uh, worldly music, right? Secular music. Okay. What he's trying to say is, is that there's a message in the music is what he's trying to say. Okay. Again, I'm not going to sit here and break down each song or songs that I used to struggle with in the past. Let's just say, is it possible no, it is possible. If the music is not of the Holy Spirit, and, and who's behind the music? The elemental spirits of the world. The first order of things. Okay? And so what are they doing? They're influencing people to speak words that are the spirit of error. And can the spirit of error also come into the church? Can it also come into the music of the church? Yes, it can. That's why we need to be discerning of spirits. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to help us to be able to see that. Somebody else, give me another example. Yes, sir. Multimedia. Multi multimedia. You talk about social media. Social media. Thank you. Sabrina, I think she said it too. Social media. Okay. So you see the people there, and what are they doing? They're laying in their bed. The rooms are dim. And <laughs> And it's speaking. It's speaking. Like, and now, now TikTok, I don't have TikTok, but I have seen a TikTok video before. And I, but I've seen people that I know, and it's like video after video after video. And what could be on the video? All kind of manner of things. You might even run across a brother preaching a message, and then the next thing, and then I, what I've heard, I can't prove it, but it makes perfect sense, that the more stuff you click on, they got your little algorithm number, and so they start feeding you that. Oh, transgender? Wow, that's kind of interesting. Let me check that out. No, that's not really interesting out there in video land. I'm trying to be facetious, and I'm making a point. Oh, transgender. The world says this is normal now. Homosexuality, adultery, whatever you want to pick, whatever your poison is. Oh, this is what they're saying in society is normal behavior. Click. Okay, now the algorithm starts feeding you. Next thing you know, you're sitting here watching transgender stuff. You're sitting here watching 
homosexuality stuff. You're sitting here watching any manner of sexual perversion that is against the will of God. And we're over here as people of God asking God to bring deliverance in our life. And as soon as he wants to bring deliverance, what do we do? Go right back. Oh, here it is. Let's go ahead and feed the flesh. Let's go ahead and let this stuff come on the inside of us. It's like we're dirtying up the water again. I know that's not wrong. I'm just trying to say this is the kind of thing yeah. that's happening. Yeah. It, it can come in movies, but it can also come from the people at work. Yeah. Right? They're out there. They're, they're TikToking it. And they're doing whatever they're doing their worldly vibe. And then we end up by the water cooler, right? We're just like, hey, what's up? You doing okay today? Yeah, man, getting blasted. We're so grinding. Getting it done. Being productive for the boss, man. Go make some money. Yeah. And then guess what? We have that. Did you hear about such and such? Or did you hear about such and such? And you know, I, this never ceases to amaze me that they get so offended if we talk about Jesus. They get so offended if we talk about Jesus, but yet it's perfectly fine for them to sit there and to talk about all their worldly antics and all the other things going on. You understand what I'm saying? This is, this is the elemental spirits of the world. And they're given philosophies, the traditions of men that are not of Christ, but instead come from the elemental spirits of the world. I need you to understand that. Again, the Apostle Paul said it, but we're not pounding it. The church is scared to preach it because people are going to be like, Woo, you're a little too weird, preacher. All you want to talk about is demonic spirit. No, all I want to talk about is Jesus. The problem is, is that people are being tormented by demonic spirits. And until we call it what it is and we allow the Lord to move in our hearts, how do they listen? Some people will be like, well, but I ain't got that, preacher. I ain't got no problem with demon spirits. Well, if we start digging around deep enough, you might realize that you are kind of being influenced a little bit more than what you realize. But sometimes demonic spirits aren't that obvious. Yep, right. right? Listen, you think, okay, in the world that we live in, in the first century when the church was birthed, everybody knew a demon spirit when they saw it. <laughs> it's all up in the New Testament. When they go, Jesus! So the Nazareth of daughter is vexed with demons. She's vexed with devils. What you set her free? <clears throat> but nowadays, it's like, oh no, it's this diagnosis and it's that diagnosis. And we give them a pill and we give them this and we put the thing back back and we think that everything's okay. But we're living in the midst of an intellectual world, my friend. And my question for you, and whether or not anybody agrees with me or not, but this is my question. Do you think that the devil don't, the devil don't know how to shut the jive? What you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about you think that just like, listen, just like an iPhone can autocorrect something, just like a human being can learn something in his mind and knows the next time whenever he faces that situation how to handle it differently. You think the devil don't know how to do that? You think the devil does not know how to observe human behavior for thousands of years and don't know how to change his game plan? You think that the elemental spirits of the world aren't part of the process of us now becoming an intellectual society to the point where we're operating in pure logic and now we're just dismissing the spiritual realm? No, I'm telling you, I believe it's purposeful. I believe it's purposeful and that the enemy does not want us to be able to be aware of the spiritual aspects that are going on in the life that we're living. But these things have been here from the beginning. And they're still here today. And they're vexing people and they're tormenting people. But I got good news. The answer is still the same. Jesus came to die to set the captive free. And that's what I want to talk to you, yes. Lord. Now, if you can't see some of these words, I want you to, I want you to go ahead and get your Bible in the back. We got that bread basket still back there. But I'm going to just tell you what it says. Look, this is Colossians chapter 2, verses 13. 14 and 15. But you know what? Before we even go there, let me give you some other scriptures. Look, let me give you some real quick scriptures real quick. We've got here 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Because I'm trying to make the point. Here's the point. The Spirit. What Spirit? Capitalized. Talk about the Holy Spirit. The Now the Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks expressly. What does he say? In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, and they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They will speak lies and hypocrisy. They will have their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is not really what I want to talk about.
Bible, but if you just move on to verse 3, you're going to be blown away. What are they going to tell people? Well, this is one thing they're going to tell people. Forbid them to marry and tell them to abstain from meats. Okay, now that doesn't cause a little bell to come off in your head about the largest religion that calls itself Christianity on the face of the earth. Then I don't know what else it takes to wake people up. Nevertheless, like, no, what I'm, no, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Let's not just, like, walk you around. Let's not tiptoe through the two. Let's, let's just go ahead and say it like it is. Whenever we look at this right here, do you think for one minute that the Catholic Church did not know that this was in here? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to say. Do you think for one second, whenever they started to tell priests that they couldn't marry a woman, okay, or that, or that, to, that holiness was going to be to abstain from needs of some sort. Now, is it the exact context? No, it's not. But the point is, how are you going to create a law within the ranks of a church knowing that there is a scripture right there that says that? Amen. You get the point. Look at Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. I'm talking about the spirits, and I'm talking about deception. Look what Paul says. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That you would not obey the truth. Somebody's cast a spiritual spell on you. What I need you to understand is that false doctrine, improper teaching that is coming, that is being energized by the elemental spirits and not by the spirit of God can produce seduction, can produce bewitching, can cast a spiritual spell on even believers who love God, but because they've submitted themselves under a spirit of error, instead of receiving freedom, they're getting tangled up and they're being placed in bondage. But look what the truth is. Paul said, foolish Galatians, somebody cast a spell on you that you wouldn't believe the truth. Look at this. But see what he preaches, what he's saying, but before your eyes, Jesus Christ has evidently been set forth crucified among you. Now listen, you may not understand this completely, but just trust me on this for now. If you hang around long enough, you'll start to see it more and more. You need to understand that the truth is always, always, in some way, shape, or form, interconnected to the sacrifice of Jesus. It goes all the way back to the beginning. This is the plan of God. Because this is how the Father chose to deal with sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not the death of you, not the death of me. Like I told that lady a long time ago, not the death of the Muslim martyr. All those bloods are tainted with sin. It has to be the death of a sinless one because Adam was created out of sinless ground, out of a ground that was not cursed and life-giving spirit of God. The pneuma of God, the spirit of God breathed life into that lump of clay and that lump of clay became a living soul and that living soul had no sin in him. You need to understand that. Two men walked the face of the earth without sin, but only one died that way. Adam died in his sin. Jesus, the last Adam, gained victory over sin because when he allowed his sinless life to be offered up as a sacrifice for sinful man, he paid the debt, hallelujah, and death had no right to hold him down because he himself had no sin, hallelujah. The resurrection was inevitable. But what it does for you and I is it proves to us that the Father accepted it. And it proves to me that I can trust it. Amen. Amen. That I can have faith in it. Well, yeah, preacher, I've heard that before. You know, like, yeah, I've got to put my faith in Jesus for, to be saved from sin. But, 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 but now we need to move past that. Because, see, now, now we've got to move forward and deal with all these elemental spirits, preacher. Well, well, well that's what we're going to do. We gotta, but, but we can't move forward. We've got to stay in the same place. Colossians 2 6 says that the same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. So, look, I want to share with you right here. Look, this is, this is part of the issue. We're going to start with this. Look, you were dead. You were dead. In what? In your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now, let's just talk about this trespass concept for a second. I, look, I've been bringing my dog to go run down this. This dead end road where the Garisco people own property back there, they want to build a neighborhood. And I mean, I've been running back there for years, for years. I went to go bring the dog the other day. Guess what? No trespassing. Right there at the front of the road. 
No trespassing. And for one split second, I said, hmm. Hmm. I want to go past that sign. And you know what the Lord said? No, son. You've done enough trespassing. Respect the sign. Right? And but that isn't that what we did? The Lord has given us boundaries in his word. And what do we do? We 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 oftentimes we trespass them. Right? And what we do, then all of a sudden, we're like all upset and we're all contorted in our mind because we don't understand how things ended up the way that they did. Well, you know, like mom used to tell me, you silly little goose. What did you think was going to happen, Matthew? Whenever you transgressed and you went against and you broke the rule and you went in another direction, what did you think was going to happen? Amen. Paul said, don't give place to the devil. Yes. Paul said, like, look, I've given an illustration multiple times where I'll open the door. And then we think we're going to shut the door real quick, but what happens? The old devil, yep. Amen. he sticks his foot in the door. That big old nasty hook with that claw on it. And I'm like, no, I want to close the door, Dad. No, 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 you let me in. You gave me permission. And I won't have to leave just yet. No, he doesn't have to leave in Christ. We have authority in the Lord. Amen. But you and I need to understand the problem is that many times when we open the door, there, there was a reason we opened the door. Right. It looked good. It smelled good. We thought it was going to be good. But the reality of it is, is that now we've caused all kinds of trouble. For our hearts. All right. So we were dead in trespasses and sin. You know, before Christ came, mankind was dead after the fall of man, dead to the life of God. The spirit, that's why it says in Ezekiel 36, we're not going to turn there, but in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27, it talks about a new covenant. God said, I'm going to make a new covenant with my people. And he said, in this new covenant, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. Now, you see, this is the beauty. You can't get away from this. Because, like, if you're like me, when the Lord first starts revealing things to me about the, about the message of the cross, about the message of the new covenant, whatever you want to call it, I'm, like, not that I want to be a naysayer. That's not how it work. But anytime I see any little thing that calls into question what somebody's trying to teach me, then I got to figure it out. Okay, well, guess what? And the Lord's kind of dealing with me a little bit, but he wants me to dig. And so this is what I think. You know how I many long it took me to figure this out? It took me a while. But I'm so grateful on the day that I realized it. That the ashes of the red heifer, my friend. Oh, it doesn't get any better than this. The ashes of the red heifer. Really a bloodless sacrifice. Even if it bled, you wouldn't have known it because the color of the red heifer was very similar to coagulated blood. And the way that they would kill it, they wouldn't slice its throat, they wouldn't collect its blood. Instead, what I've heard is that they would actually knock it on the head. They knock it on the head, and then what they do, I know it seems sad, but that's, your, that's our sin that caused all that, right? That's a type of what the cost was going to be. Because if you're sorry for the red heifer, you should just think how sorry we should be for, for Jesus. Okay, but nevertheless, they, they take that animal and they don't bleed it. And they burn the whole thing. It says it in the book of Leviticus, blood and all. They blood, they burn the whole thing till you get this pile of ashes. And look, a pile of ashes for a red heifer, none of this is in my message, it's just lying out. But look, the, the pile of ashes of a red heifer lasts for years because they just use a little tincture of it. It's just like a little pinch. You get like the purification water, take a little pinch of the ashes of the red heifer, poom. Stir it up, and then guess what? Now we got some cleansing waters. Sprinkle it. Sprinkle it on the person that's been touched by a leper. Sprinkle it on the articles that need cleansing and sanctification. Sprinkle. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. But it wasn't water. It was the blood in the water. The blood of the red heifer. The blood of a type of the sacrifice of Jesus that was bringing cleansing. He said, I will sprinkle clean water on you and I will renew your spirit. Your spirit was dead. My spirit was dead to the things of God. You know what? You need to stop right now. Even if it was your mama and you're mad at your mama right now. If your mama told you about Jesus, you need to be thankful to the Lord that somebody got saved, hallelujah, and told you about Jesus. And that day that you received Christ as your Lord and Savior, guess what happened? Sprinkle. Sprinkle with the cleansing waters. Renewal of the spirit of man. That which was dead to the things of God. Brought to life. And then he said this. He said, and in that new covenant, I'm going to put my spirit on the inside. 
inside of you. I'm going to put my spirit on the inside of you. Now in the new covenant, when you and I get saved, the Holy Spirit, listen to me, child of God, all you that are in here, you that are born again from the dead, the spirit of the living God lives on the inside of you. He that has all authority over the demonic realm, he that has all authority, he that destroyed principalities and powers, Live on the inside of you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have victory in Christ. Yes. That's what the word of God said. You were dead in the trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now you know what that word uncircumcision means right there. What does that mean? Not in what? Christ. Not in Christ. We can say that. Chris hit the word I was looking for. Not in covenant. Which in Christ is covenant. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, because, see, covenant is an agreement. I mean, at its base, look, we can get into some deep stuff, but let's just keep it simple. Covenant is an agreement. God made an agreement with sinful man. His agreement was that he was going to make a way for sin to be dealt with so that he could have a relationship with sinful man. So the covenant was is that he would send forth his son. That was always his plan. You were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold from the vain traditions of your fathers, but instead you were redeemed with a precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained before. Let me say it again. Foreordained. It was in God's mind, planned by God, before what? The foundations of the earth. Before God founded the earth, he knew man was going to fall prey to the evil one. He knew it was going to happen, and he knew that he was going to send his son, Jesus. I didn't plan on getting in all this, but let me tell you something. Let me remind you of something. You and I get in little squabbles. I know. I can look at it. Some of y'all, I know y'all been in. I didn't have squabbles with a couple of you people. I mean, not bad ones, thank God. But we've disagreed on a thing or two. But you know, one of the things that, but, but thank God, I don't think now, I've never brought any of y'all to court. Matter of fact, I've never brought anybody to court. But, but thank you, Jesus. I've been brought to court. I never brought anybody to court. But look, let me just say something about this. We're over here quibbling, squibbling, having a little trouble. In my, and, you know, Paul even told the Corinthians. He said, you, brother brings brother to court, I think of the Corinthians. He said, brother brings brother to court. Did you not know that one day you will judge angels? Somehow in the mind of God, listen to me, this is stuff that's too deep to be trying to talk about because I'm not even getting to verse 13 and 14. But look, somehow in the mind of God, when the celestial, celestial, angelic, if you will, rebellion took place, in God's mind, he was going to remedy the whole thing by sending his son and in some way <clears throat> dealing with the celestial through us, the terrestrial, by allowing you and I to be introduced to his spirit, by allowing you and I to receive of his glory, by allowing you and I, by faith, in something that we had never seen, to receive by faith the life of God on the inside of us, when those celestial beings had seen him and all of his glory. Now, this is Matt's philosophy. I'm going to sit here and tell you, but it's based upon what I believe to be true in the scriptures. I got to deal with you. One day you will judge angels some kind of way. And this is the way that I feel like the Lord is showing me. That even in the mind of God before man was ever founded on the face of the earth, God knew that he was going to just not only remedy your sin problem, my sin problem, but he was going to wrap up in a tight little neat bow even the celestial rebellion that had taken place beforehand and God is justice in doing such a thing because again they were in his literal presence saw his glory with their celestial eyes and still rebelled against him and yet you and I what did he tell Thomas? Go ahead Thomas stick your finger right here. Go ahead thrust, thrust your hand in my side oh no I believe Lord he didn't say it like this, but he basically, well, that's good, Thomas. But what about all them that won't be able to see? And yet they will believe. Yeah. See, that's where you and I are. We may not, some of you see things in the spiritual realm more than others, and I get that, and thank God for that. Thank God for those gifts that God has given you, amen? Don't let it pop you out, though, Christian. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to serve your master. The purpose is to serve your king. A multifaceted body coming together with its gifts. 
operating in unity and in unison. Why? So that the King of Glory might come in. Hallelujah. That He might be exalted. That He might be magnified. And that people would be set free. Yes. But God is going to use you and I one day to judge these rebellious, wicked angels. One day, one day we're going to hang out in Paul's letters for a while now. I think this is what the Lord wants us to do. We're going to hang out in Paul's letters for a while. But I just want to mention one thing. Sometimes when we get to the lust of the flesh, I want you to think about this. I don't know why, but this, is, this one word has been stuck in my mind for about four days. Malice. Malice. Ill will or ill intent towards another person. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is you think that them demons ain't got malice towards you? Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. They hate you. Yep. They hate the God you serve and they hate touching you. They hate you so much. They're bloodthirsty. They're soul thirsty. They want people's souls. Yeah. But I want you to think about this. When somebody brings correction into your life or somebody does something even that's wrong and not godly, does it ever rise up in you to want ill will towards them? Yeah. Oh, something bad's going to happen to you now, buddy. <laughs> See, because look, when people... Come against me by the grace of God. This is what I want to do. When I see that in me, because look, you think the enemy ain't trying to put malice in my heart? Because sure. I'm a human being, my friend. <laughs> I can still deal with the same thing, but I'm here to tell you the Lord Holy Ghost wants to root it out of us. Yeah. If we're over here like, mm, you're going to get your day coming, buddy. Look how you acting to me. You're not respecting my anointing. You're not doing this. You're not, no, 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 no. That's not the presence of God. The presence of God is saying, my. Fall on your knees. Fall on your knees for that brother. Fall on your knees for that sister. Ask me to move in their heart. They're bound up in their own heart. Look, they did. You're wrong, but the answer is not for you to have malice towards them. The answer is for you to have humility for you to be like your humble king and lower yourself and to cry out that I would heal this. Does that make sense? I don't even know why. I think somebody needs to hear something about malice. Because it's been in my heart for three days. So I'm just letting you know, if you got malice, Lord, take it away. Lord, let your spirit just take it away. Lord, come and Jesus. Give us peace. Amen. All right. So we were dead in the trespasses and the circumcision of our flesh. We were outside of covenant with God. But look, he made us alive together with him. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 6 says that you were baptized into his death baptized into his burial, and even as he was raised in newness of life, you too should walk in newness of life. Yes. He made us alive together with him. I can't tell you the power that is in this truth. You remember last week we talked about also Romans 4 about justification and about the concept of justification is that God speaking, declaring, Rich, you're innocent. Pamela, you're innocent. Jessica, you're innocent. Wade, you're innocent. Miss Brenda, you're innocent. Preacher, you're innocent. The Lord, really? Yes! You're innocent because I say so, but why, God? I might still be struggling in this area. I might still be. No! You're innocent, I said. Why? Because you put your faith in the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I didn't expect you to be able to do it in your own strength. The more you believe my word and quit believing the elemental spirits and the philosophies of men and the spirit of error that's leading humanity in the wrong direction, the spirit of truth will set you free. He's forgiven us all these trespasses. How did he do this? Look at this. It's different in the King James. Y'all want to see what it says in the King James? I know y'all do. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of order that says that was against us. That was contrary to us. He took it out of the way. He nailed it. To his cross. I want you to see this though. Look, I like the way that he says it. No reason why is because it kind of like brings the language to where I live. A record of debt. The idea is if you went to the courthouse, there was a legal document. I'm going down to the St. Mary Courthouse and I need the record of debt referring to Matthew James A. Mayor, please, sir. Okay, here you go. Let me see. H A H E. Here we go. Here's the book. Here you go, sir. 
boom, big old boat. Okay, now I have a turn. Look, if I'm outside of Christ, there's a record of debt. What is the record of debt? The law calls you guilty, sir. Wow. The law of God calls you guilty. You transgress the law of God. But I got good news. Mm, that's good. He removed the record of debt. That's right. Listen to me, Christian. Your Jesus, my Jesus, when he died on the cross, his sinless life, he kept God's law to perfection. Oh, well, I don't know about all of that because, you see, Jesus allowed his disciples to grab grain on the Sabbath. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. No, nah, Jesus did that on purpose, man. Jesus came on did that on purpose so that he could rebuke the religious leaders because they were, they were teaching improper doctrine and all philosophies of men, elements of the, the spiritual elements of the world, the elemental spirits, the philosophies of men. Holy man calling down. Spirit of religion, holy mankind down. God, Jesus did it on purpose when he healed the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, when he healed the blind man, when he told the disciples they could do that because he said, look, the Sabbath was, was, was made for man. Right. Amen? Like in other words, I think I said that right. As a matter of fact, let me correct myself about something last week, Sunday. It was a great service. When I said that about the children of Israel having to go through some things, I went back to double check myself. I want you to know the children of Israel, I do believe, they experienced that. They definitely experienced the tyranny of Pharaoh, right? They experienced the tyranny of Egypt. They experienced, they were slaves in the midst of Egypt, okay? But I said that they had experienced all of the plagues. And I don't know, I didn't get a chance to go back and see exactly what I said, but I went back and I looked. It doesn't say specifically for the first four who was affected, who wasn't. But for three of them, it specifically says that that did not touch the children of Israel. I got good news for you. Because even though we're in the midst of all of the decay that's taking place in our society, even though we don't know exactly what we will have to face before it's all said and over, I want you to know that God will always still be with his people. Amen. He will always be there to protect his people. So again, I felt like I needed to like correct myself in that. But look, because I don't know exactly what I said, I don't think I said it wrong, but I think that I was kind of thinking something. So in case I did, there's a public correction that, you know, uh, God will always be with you. Amen? All right. So with, with regards to this, the record of debt that stood against us, I want you to see this. It had legal commands. Jesus took the record of debt that was against us. And what did he do? I want you to see it. I'm going to change my little color right here. He nailed it to his cross. So that's what I want you to understand is this. When we're talking about the cross, Many times people get confused and they think we're only talking about salvation. But I'm trying to talk to you about the cross as it regards spiritual warfare. All right? And what are you talking about? Well, because look, triumphing over them ended is what the King James Version says. But look, I just want you to see right now, he spoiled principalities and powers. Okay, but I want you to see what it says. And whatever... When you conquer another kingdom, whatever's left over, you get to keep it for yourself. You see, that's the spoil. But the idea is, is that you won, you, somebody else won the battle, and that the person that won the battle got the goods. But look, if you look at the word in the modern English kind of concept, according to the definition, part of the meaning is that they were disarmed. <clears throat> Jesus disarmed who? Rulers and authorities. Now, I want you to see this in the King James, principalities and powers. As a matter of fact, let me just show you a little neat trick with this Bible app. Principalities, I clicked on that. I want you to see, is oftentimes I used this last week, and it talks about beginning, and it talks about magistrates, because sometimes it can talk about human leaders. But look what it says in Romans 8.38. You may not be able to read it, but I'm going to read it to you. Romans 8.38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers can keep us from the presence of God. Uh, it says right here, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 21. He's far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion in every name that is named. Not only in this world, but the world to come. Right? He says right here, and for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers. Even in the Gospel of John, where Jesus called Satan the prince of this world, this is the same root word. What I need you to understand is this. He spoiled 
principalities and powers. Going back to this, though, talking about this, where it says rulers and authorities, that gives you a wrong impression. So sometimes some of these other translations work well, but it's not telling us what we really need to say. It's making it sound like it's human rulers and, and authorities, and that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about these spiritual beings, and it says that Jesus disarmed them. Now I want you to think about this. I was thinking about this the other night. Could you imagine, because I want you to understand about this one. I got, cause look, I want to share some stuff with y'all. Dude, I'm getting all of these testimonies. I mean, you know, at least in the last couple, two, three weeks, testimonies of the Lord just rushing in like a river and just setting people free. <laughs> Dude, it was just yes. amazing. Yes, Lord. And that's basically what he did for me the night I was in the barroom bathroom. Out of nowhere. <clears throat> and... Look, I am far from perfect, but I am so different than I used to be mm -hmm. by His grace. Amen. Aren't you glad I'm different than I used to be? But I want you to imagine for a second that you're at home. I know this is kind of freaky. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. But you're at home, and somebody just busts through the door. And he's got a gun. And he puts it to Mike Landry Jr.'s head, or he puts it to somebody else's head, and he begins to demand that you're going to do what he's telling you to do. And let's just pretend because each person's made up differently. Some people will be like, okay, boss, I'm ready for the bullet. Go ahead and send me home to the Lord. But some people may not be ready like that, right? And instead, they start to quake in fear. Their spirit is just paralyzed. And they're arrested by this force that has got a hold of them. And now they're in bondage. And they're like, just please, please, please don't take my life. I'll do whatever it is that you're asking me to do. And let's just say that this goes on for like some period of time. Let's not make it too long, two hours. Of just pure torment, right? Where just fear has stricken and paralyzed. And then now let's just pretend in our minds for one quick second something weird happens. I don't know what. Out of nowhere. And then now all of a sudden I got to go. <coughs> uh oh. Now I got to go. You see, you busted up in my house. You've been having me living in fear with this gun stuck up to my head, but now I got to go. And now you ain't got the gun no more, buddy. And now you've been disarmed. And now I'm the one that's got the power source. The script has been flipped. That may be a bad illustration, but let me give you another one. Out of Matthew chapter 12, Jesus healed and delivered the man that was, what was he, a, de a deaf mute or he was a mute? And what did the, uh, I'm going to shoot from the hip here. Help me out now if I said it wrong. Okay. And then the Lord says this. They said, oh, you cast out devils by Beelzebub. He said, no, if I cast out devils by the hand of God, by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Yes. He said, unless a man first, unless you first go into the strong man's house and you bind him, yes. you cannot spoil his goods. Come on. Jesus came to bind the, spoil, the, the strong man, my friend. Yes. Jesus came to bind the strong man so that you and I can walk in victory. Jesus disarmed principalities and powers Jesus came to give us the victory. The, the, look, the, the script's been flipped where Satan had power and authority over people's lives. Now he's like Dagon laying face first in the presence of the Lord and the spiritual authority has been broken in the name of yes, Jesus. in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The word of God says that he disarmed them and he put them to open shame, Hallelujah. triumphing over them. Hallelujah. The ESV says in him. But the King James says in it. In it. Let's just see what some other ones say. Oh, look at this. This is the one nobody likes right here. The NIV. Let's see what the NIV says. Triumphing over them. How? By the cross. You see that? Even the NIV. Look at that. He triumphed over them. Through the cross. Because you see, it's not just any Jesus that triumphed over them. It's the sacrifice of Jesus. Why? Because it's in Christ, the sinless one, that paid the debt that gave the enemy the legal right to hold you in bondage. He no longer has that legal right. He has been defeated. <laughs> Through Jesus and what Jesus did. Yes. Singers and musicians, Amen. I think we need to close out with a song. 
I think we need to allow the Lord to minister to us one last time. We're going to close out in the song, amen. We're going to go out of the house of God worshiping Him.